uh, Amazon chapter, SDSN Amazonia. This event is accelerating ESG and SDG practices in mining companies and territories. And we are so thrilled at, uh, that all of you were able to join us today. We have some uh, interesting presentations and some exciting speakers. My name is Lauren Barreto. I am Chief of Staff at the SDSN, and I'm going to be your first speaker. After me, we'll go to Renato Simonelli. He's Chairman of the Geopark Quadrilatero, and he's also a member of the SDSN Amazonia. After he speaks, we'll hear from Doris Hyam Galvez, Senior Advisor at Hatch, and Priscilla Nelson, who's a professor and ENO director at the Colorado School of Mines. So I'm going to start by giving a very brief overview of uh, the SDSN, who we are and what we do, and share with you a publication that we released in 2016 specifically on mining and the SDGs. So the SDSN has been operating under the auspices of the UN Secretary General since 2012. Our president is Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He's an economist based at Columbia University. And our mission is to mobilize scientific and technical expertise uh, from all sectors, uh, but particularly from academia, in support of solutions for attaining the SDGs. And those are the 17 sustainable development goals that the United Nations member states adopted in 2015. Our work can be broken down into three pillars, um, policy analysis, the SDG Academy, and our global network. So we number 1,700 plus members uh, that are organized into 45 chapters, some of them at the regional level, like SDSN Amazonia, and some of them at the national level. So the United States, Brazil, South Africa, China, um, we have networks around the world, and I'll put up a map in one more minute. This is just a brief review of some of our uh, global policy analysis work. Uh, one of the examples is we publish the annual SDG index as part of the sustainable development report. This document ranks countries on their performance on the SDGs, um, looking at all 17 goals and a number of indicators under each goal. This document is also available at the regional level. Um, you can see Africa, Arab, um, the European Union, for example, and we also publish a number of subnational indices, um, cities in Spain, cities in the United States, um, provinces and, and states in the United States, et cetera. We also published the World Happiness Report that was just released uh, earlier in March, about a month ago, um, and a number of global policy documents. Like I said, in, in one more minute, I'll go over uh, the specific report that we did on mining. The SDG Academy uh, is an online curriculum of massive open online courses. To date, we have about 45 of them, um, and all of them are targeted at preparing current and future generations uh, to help support SDG achievement. We're also proud to offer a fully online master's program with degrees granted by Sunway University in Malaysia and the Uni University College Dublin in Ireland. Um, this is a selection of a number of the courses that they offer, and I just wanted to highlight a few that I think might be relevant to this group and our participants. How to achieve the SDGs. This is a practical deep dive on um, successful policies and programs to support SDG achievement. Natural Resources for Sustainable Development has a lot of con uh, content specifically on mining, oil and gas, mineral extraction, um, other industries that are very important for jobs and economic growth. Um, and, you know, at the same time, potentially very damaging and with a lot of good case studies and best practices on how to amplify the positive aspects um, while mitigating any, any negative impacts. And you also might be interested in one of our newer courses, Industrial Policy in the 21st Century. Uh, finally, just a brief note on this third pillar, the SDSN networks. I would encourage all of you uh, to reach out and get involved. Um, as you can see, we have regional chapters, um, for example, the Andean Corridor, the Amazon Basin, the Francophone Sahel, uh, South Asia, national networks in Brazil, the United States, South Africa, China, um, and a lot of places there's overlap between the two, um, where you have the Mediterranean basin, for example, with national chapters for Spain, France, Italy, um, and also a regional group looking at the, the basin as a whole. 
turning to the topic of the day, specifically uh, mining and the SDGs and the ways that mining and the SDGs are, are linked and the ways that mining companies can support SDG achievement. Uh, as I said, we released this report uh, a few years ago. It's intended to be an introduction to the many linkages between mining and the SDGs, and it is available in multiple languages, uh, including Spanish, French, and Portuguese. It has a lot of content. Uh, it's a pretty deep and technical report. It briefly explains what the SDGs are and includes key targets that have been defined by the United Nations. It looks at opportunities of how companies can support the SDGs in their core business, as well as how they can support them through collaboration with other partners and the leveraging of resources. It has a diagram, uh, which I will not talk about right now because I'm going to put it up in one more second. It has some case studies, and I'll share an example of those. And then for each of the SDGs, it also has a list of additional research, uh, resources where you can learn more and see more case studies and uh, explore more methodologies about what could uh, what your role could play, whether you're a company or a civil society organization or an academic. So this is the diagram. Um, I will apologize. I know the text is very small. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I just wanted to give you an overview of the many ways that uh, the mining sector does touch on all 17 SDGs. And I'll go through uh, six or seven of the key ones in one more minute. Um, but I also want to flag, for example, if you look at uh, sort of roughly 1 PM on the clock, SDG 1, um, it's looking at the positives that the mining sector is already providing and can be amplified, um, things like job creation and uh, economic expansion, while also looking at some of the downsides like uh, displacement and uh, exploring, again, best practices of how to reduce some of these unforeseen consequences or prepare for them um, or mitigate what might be foreseen negative impacts to communities and territories. So getting into a little bit deeper, um, these are some graphics from the executive summary, uh, looking at here, for example, SGG 1 and 2, and digging a little bit deeper into some of the items that you saw on the previous diagram. Um, things like the way that mining companies can pay taxes and royalties and what that can do to support local development um, and local governments and help them with poverty eradication programs. Under agriculture, things like um, keeping farmland pollution free, keeping water pollution free, making sure that you're being transparent about the management of water resources for agriculture, um, you know, all of these different things. And then for each of these SDGs, there is a much, uh, as I said, longer chapter. Looking at a couple more examples, uh, ones that I think are highly relevant for mining, not that all 17 of them aren't, but, you know, maybe some of the more um, commonly thought of or traditional ones, SDG 6 on clean water and sanitation, things like monitoring water quality, managing water holistically, and this one has one of my favorite case studies, which comes to us from Vale. They have a plant in Para where they're actually recycling almost 100% of the water from the tailing ponds. Um, they're treating it and they're using it in their processes and um, basically just sort of running all the same water um, constantly throughout the system, which is great because they're not drawing water from the river. Um, they're not putting uh, more contaminated water into ever growing and increasing tailing ponds. Um, and it's just a really great case study of, you know, some of the really promising and, and great things that, that can happen. Uh, SDG 7 as well, things like improving energy efficiency in your operations and incorporating renewable energy to power uh, local energy needs um, and different ways that you could maybe use some of the infrastructure that companies are building to support local communities um, and some of the ways too that investments in increasing access to energy um, can support those communities even after mine closures, things like expanding the grid or installing renewable energy generation capacity that can supply not only the mine, but also surrounding communities and populations. A couple more that are highly important, SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth. Um, this one talks a lot about local procurement and some of the ways that um, you can expand not just sort of the job creation of the mine, but different ways that um, some of the near mine activities can help uh, grow local economies and raise people out of poverty and provide decent jobs. SDG 9 is all about industry innovation and infrastructure. Um, here again, there's a lot more on local 
procurement um, and a lot around sharing infrastructure, um, which I, I won't go into in too much detail because I briefly talked about that um, in terms of some of the energy infrastructure that could be explained, uh, could be shared and explored. Um, but this one talks a lot more about other infrastructure as well, including rail, water, ICT, um, different things like that. Finally, wrapping up with a couple um, other SDGs, uh, sort of the G of our ESG pillar around governance. Um, there's a lot on peace, justice, and strong institutions. There's a lot in this part of the report around respecting indigenous rights and some great case studies of how to effectively do um, free prior informed consent and consultations um, and different ways that you can uh, try to locate and cite things in ways that are respectful of indigenous and local communities, as well as some tips and tricks on preventing conflict Again, supported by some really excellent case studies with some people who are doing some very innovative things in this space. And then mining and partnerships for the goals, uh, SDG 17, things about how to mobilize financial resources and technology. Um, and there's a lot of innovative stuff in here too around sharing uh, geological data, georeference data, um, different things around, um, around data sharing and, and support to achieving the SDGs and the ways that, that companies can support that. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I know I went through all of that very quick. I will put the link to the report in the chat, and I hope many of you uh, will consider downloading it. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have in the discussion, or if anybody wants to learn more about this work, uh, we can touch base offline. As I said, I will stop there. And our next Presenter is Renato Simonelli, the chairman of Geopark Quadrilateral. So I am going to stop my screen share and uh, turn it over to him. Renato, please. Just a minute. Hello. Take your time. <laughs> okay. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Well, good morning. Welcome to all the webinar participants. Uh, the massive, the massive registration to the webinar consolidates the creation of the platform Vision to SDGs in mining territories. It started in 2021. We invite all globally to participate and collaborate effectively in favor of the mining communities stakeholders, companies, and sustainability of the territory. We also expect the proposal and organization of new webinars led by members of the platform Visions to SDG in Mining Territories. Dear Lauren Barhead, thanks for your leading position in the organization of the platform and associated webinars, and for the opening and introduction section that invites and engages the mining community to STSN. Sustainable Development Solution Network on the United States, United Nations, and to our new platform, Vision to SDGs in Mining Territory. We will certainly add transformation tools, skills, and subsidies to local strategies and practice with these initiatives. Welcome also to the challenge in aligning ESG and SDGs, and to the lead of the collaborative agenda, Joe 30 for Prosperity. My greetings to all my colleagues at SDSN, particularly those at the SDSN platform Visions to SDG in Mining Territories, and to my dear Brazilians present in the audience. It is great to come after Lauren Barreto that as SDSN head of partnerships is facilitating the access of the mining community to numerous initiatives of SDSN in the last years. I acknowledge and register here my gratitude to the support received from the New York team and the SDSN Amazonia office that hosted formerly the platform and the webinar. A special thanks to the speakers, Professor Priscilla Nelson and Dr. Dorothy M. Galvez for their immediate positive response to make part of this first event, bring very innovative and rich experience applied to our case. Our platform is celebrating one year of creation with the establishment of the first inaugural objectives. I am particularly happy with the organization of the first webinar and the future ones of the series that will attract more members 
and make the platform more dynamic and collaborative. The present webinar was conceived to force alignment and cross-linking of ESG and SDG practice standards and fundamentals. This first webinar will launch globally to a larger audience, our new SDSN platform, Visions to SDGs in Mining Territories, fostering international interactions, building and consolidating a global collaborative network of specialists to explore concepts and best practice, also disseminating principles and guidelines, facilitating synergism and cross-linking of mining companies and mineral territory practice assets and expectations. The SDG practices and standards will emerge in the mining sector as a key drive for SDGs in combined efforts. The objective of the platform highlighted in this webinar is to identify, identify and explore possible collaboration points and potential projects or initiatives that could be pursued to accelerate the uptake of the SDGs as they relate to mining. Efforts should not be duplicative, but rather should fill gaps, amplify existing work, solve common problems, or foster better coordination between fragmented works. The 17 SDGs can be grouped in four main dimensions, social, environmental, economic, and institutional. But what unites them most is that they were conceived to be implemented in integration and connection against governance, culture, practice, and orientation, and diversity in favor of silos, isolation, or preference. It is natural and almost impossible, however, to avoid that some SDGs and associated goals receive more attention from specific private segments, territories, and communities. The solution is that, in parallel, within the definition and rules of concept of the SDGs, they are all being implemented integrated, interconnected, and in capillarity. Accelerating in the title and in the scope of the webinar raised the question that either the mining territories or the mining companies pursue more speed in the implementation of the SDGs and ESG respectively through the synergies, align and cross-linking of the two as a competitiveness factor for both companies and territory. Also accelerating behavior expects from both parts sense of urgency to avoid silos favorably of some governance leaderships and groups against a more systemic and integrated implementation, connection and capillarity of all the SDGs. In the second case, some of the SDGs relate to education, energy, water, climate change, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, or no discrimination against women and girls as examples may be prioritized, but if they, are, if they are in capillarity within all the 70s, they will be received well as they empower all the others, or the key factor affect implementation time also. Although apparently obvious, our proposal of alignment and cross link of ESG and SDGs requires a positive behavior, mainly from the mining companies. The Responsible Mining Report 2022 anticipates both difficulties and favorable conditions for the synergies, like focus on informalities, few benchmarking companies and case, the isolated preference and dominance of silence in the selection of an implementation of SDGs, but at the same time, the wish, the collective wish to make right among many other assessments. The middle-term network deliverers of the vision to SDG mining territory will be a more in-depth understanding from all the, all the parties of ESG and SDGs as frameworks that we understand are key factors in their implementation. Among the utility or adventure of the SDG framework, we can select SDGs are democratic and not in conflict with norms and values. SDGs are an opportunity for cooperation between mining companies and local populations. SDGs support effective practice of ESG in mining companies. SDGs should be more than a communication objective, but part of the internal strategy of mining companies. SDG initiatives could attract fundraising. And finally, the SDGs can help leaders and stakeholders explore and promote change in culture to support a better future. A remark about ESG 
reality is that many investors are increasingly complaining that the ESG data universe is getting too complex and confusing. It's our proposal here that the development of a function or equation that describes the relation between ESG and SDG parameters and variables is a pursued innovative achievement and tool. The adoption of ESG and SDGs as a joint procedure consolidates a more normalized, integrated, and instead connection, relation, function, or equation. Accelerating ESG and SDG practicing mining companies and territories means that company, territory, and government representatives align their frameworks to go beyond isolated targets, but rather combine and synergic ones. ESG and SDG are frameworks to be optimized. All the alternative frameworks can be added to ESG and SDGs as hegemonic and non-hegemonic movements. The SDG 17 refers to the interconnection of frameworks, partnerships, and experience of implementation that empower the integration and implementation of the SDGs and their alignment and cross-linking with ESG practices and standards. A final closing remark is that definitely an integrated platform, ESG, SDGs, is pursued. Thank you very much. Laurie, you can go on. Yes, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Renato. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor now to Doris Haim Galvez uh, from Hatch to deliver her presentation, please. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning. I will try to get the presentation up. Take your time. <laughs> yes. I can get it. Okay. Can you see my screen? Um, we can, but unfortunately, the display uh, is the opposite again. <laughs> I will fix that again. Um, while you're taking one second to do that, I will just remind people uh, on the line to please go ahead and use the chat to introduce yourselves, say hi, say where you're calling from. Um, but there's a different option at the bottom of the Zoom window for Q&A. It would be helpful for us if you're asking questions to the panelists or if you're submitting questions for the discussion uh, to use that part of Zoom. And then feel free to submit them as they come up. We'll hold them all to the end. But um, if you have a question for a particular presenter or something you want clarified, go ahead and, and send it to us as soon as you think of it. Uh, Doris, your slides look great. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good morning again. So just wanted to share this subject, subject that's really dear to my heart. And it's the reason why it's called Designing Sustainable Prosperity. It is a, a structured approach to enable the creation of future sustainable society. It is a practical method that integrates many disciplines to create a prosperity that is beyond uh, financial performance. And I will explain a bit more as I go. And also another way to describe perhaps is DSP accelerates achieving the ESGs and uh, SDGs in mining regions. This method was developed for them to increase resilience in mining regions. And most of the approach can be illustrated in this graph. As you can see in the vertical axis is the purchasing power of the local people. And in the horizontal is the time, years. All uh, mining have a finite life. So they all end, it could be 50 years, 100 years, but they all end. So the objective is to establish 
long-term viable economic base. For example, if you can see when mining arrives to town and when they reach full capacity, there is jobs for the local people and the purchasing power goes up. As the mine reaches the end of its life, jobs dry out and there is no more income. And we have all accepted mining is the driver of the economy. And in many cases in these regions, rural regions, or some, mining could be the only provider of income. So, but it ends. So there is another economic activity that is generated because of mining and that's the yellow curve. That's the suppliers, equipment suppliers, service, restaurants, hotels, tourists, because people come to town and therefore there is a, this type of economy, but follows the same trend. It also ends when the mine ends. Of course, this is not what we want to see. We want some level of economic activity to continue after the mine has ended. And this is what we focus on. That's what DSP does, is the green space. But we start very early. We can start at any stage, but better if you do it early because uh, we use the time of boom to create, to diversify the economy beyond mining in order to, so these are long lasting business that's going to stay uh, after closure. But also they have to have some scale as you can see here in order to have an impact on the economy. Today, you know, there's a lot of great examples all over mining regions, but they're so small, they get dwarfed by the magnitude of the mining. And at the end, you know, may not likely survive. So the key point here is we have all accepted the red mining, the driver of the economy, and we relax and everything is fine. But you know, it ends very quickly, it comes as temporary. So the key is the mining transitions from being the main provider of income to be a catalyst for regional prosperity. So uses its power and position to bring everyone to the table because everyone has to work for the common good. And then in that situation, there should be no conflict because there will be other players and everybody's working for the benefit of all. So it's a method and a process and the process, so this occurs in the field. So it's not in a desk. Uh, in an office designing, but it's really with the key interested parties on site. So the seven key steps. First, we establish a platform for collaboration between key interested parties, communities, investors, government, knowledge experts, etc. Then we build facts. So this is the integrating multiple disciplines in a footprint scale and match to the market need. These are the facts. Then we use these facts to align the key interested parties because every interested party has different needs. So the facts, the science aligns all the interested. So then we create focus as the pillars of the future diverse economy. Then of course, we build a roadmap for future, including investment. And then we adapt the education system to support the future and then implementation of the plan for sustainable prosperity. So how it's done. So as you can see here, as a concept study that could last eight months to a year. But the key is, if you see to the right, we build first the inputs for the design, the facts, as I mentioned, and two key things. The first one is the integrated natural resource models. So we start using geoscience to visualize, so what can I say? to really visualize the hidden potential of the region. So we start with underground potential, a thousand or 2000 meters deep, sources of water, sources of energy, or even soil quality. So I have a really good idea what's the underground potential, the hidden potential, then surface potential, climate hazard. So put it all together, integrated, and make it very simplified for all the key interested parties to work with. Then we do an innovative world market study because they have to be needs in the market. And we use researchers to do that because not just analysts who know supply and demand, and that's the past. So we have to really include the researchers who are on top of their field to know what most likely happen. So we take those two and bring the integrated, the interested key 
parties into it. So that's the alignment. And then we do the design uh, to design the future services and technologies and products that will be needed in the future, ideal for the region. And in many cases, many issues, we start with water because water is the main issue in every region. And for guaranteeing water, we need clean and affordable energy. So water and energy go together. Then um, solutions for infrastructure based, of course, on the natural resources of the region, solutions for waste. And once we know what's possible, we adapt the education system to provide the skills and tools to support the diverse industry. I will just briefly mention a case study with all the details because we don't have time. Uh, this is the solar potential in the world. As you can see in Canada, uh, not the best, we're in the blue, blue, blue region, but still solar energy is profitable even in the Arctic. So, but as you go down, you see, you can observe the potential is better and better. And the best on earth, you can see it happens to be in the Peru and Chile region. So now let's talk a little bit about South of Peru, where you can see here in the map of Peru, they have the best solar potential. You know, it's nearly four or five times the irradiation potential of as Canada, for example. And this region has the water issue. There's no water, and there'll be no water in 20 years because the glaciers and the desert, you know, and lakes and rivers may dry up. So so they have enormous solar potential and they have no water. So we looked at uh, the first thing we have to is figure out how, how we, they can have water. So we looked at um, interesting technology that's a direct desalination of seawater with solar energy. It's a new technology that the Arabs are trying to uh, turn a desert into a forest and they have no river using seawater. So they're doing a pilot. So the idea here is for this region, do not perhaps not develop these technologies, but take one of these innovative, uh, this is a concentrated solar panel technology, take one of those. And there's also very good skills in the region on uh, pyrometallurgy because they have smelters and so on. They know how to handle fluids at high temperature. And you know, in um, CSP technology, one of the ways to lower the cost of the technology is perhaps using even handling higher temperatures or also innovative materials. So take some of these technologies and make it economically viable, perfect it, and become the center of excellence of how to make it work. So first adapting to the region, and then because you have to develop your IP to have a long, long-term enterprises and, and maintain your economy on the long, in the long run. And once you have affordable clean energy and water, clean water, of course, the agriculture and the innovative food products, and then adapt your education system to support that. So what's needed in order to make this happen? There has to be a potential and that's the reason we do these integrated natural resource models. There has to be a market, and that's the reason we do the world market, including researchers. The potential has to be identified and designed, and this is a method, a practical approach that delivers actionable items to, to create, uh, diversify the economy beyond financial uh, performance, and needs a champion that knows what it takes to make it happen. Uh, DSP should result in vibrant, long-lasting businesses with improved environment and quality of life in the mining regions. And perhaps I should add one thing I forgot. A lot of these solutions we find in these mining regions are mostly nature-based solutions. So because there is interest and there is business and there is business cases to keep in forest healthy, lakes, biodiversity, and so on. How, how am I on time, Lauren? Uh, you have a couple more minutes. Probably about four more minutes. Wow, I rushed through it. So maybe is there any... Uh, I mean, that's I okay. We're going to have a discussion later. 
Um, I actually wrote down, you know, maybe the very last point that you made is one that you might want to expand upon for one moment. I found your point that uh, you need a champion to be very compelling. And, you know, I don't know if you have one more minute of thoughts on the role of leadership, um, but I thought I thought that was, you know, perhaps an interesting thing to to maybe continue a little Excellent. bit more on. Excellent. So we need a champion to begin with. It could be one person from mining company, most likely. Is that or a member of the community or academia or government? It doesn't matter because this is a process that's on the ground. So as we do this and every key interested parties get involved all the way from data collection all the way through, we identify many more champions. Because the idea is that everybody's working together on this and they internalize, they become passionate and they want to champion because it's their ideas. So we just prepare using the science, you know, sort of a preliminary, um, like an X-ray, we figure out how the earth was formed in this region and what's possible from what they have not seen it ever. So we bring them into this dream space with facts and then take it from there and then, of course, prioritize later and develop business cases for these long lasting enterprises. And we complete with, uh, uh, as I said, business cases, attractive packages to attract investment, financing plan, education plan, and so on. So really actionable items that you can see the results probably within you know, your next investor within the first three years so that you share the risk. You, so, so the mining company is not the only one, but there are others coming in for these long lasting enterprises to build this uh, prosperity that is going to you know, survive mining. And it's different for each region because every region has different potential. And, 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 and also the world market is so full. We don't want to, uh, these regions to do commodity stuff when when you see you know there are so many countries that you may have you know a day could be a dollar a day so you don't want to do things that that are not ideally suited to your region and and expect to be able to compete in such a um, full market so it's the idea to penetrate and maintain your market by innovating constantly so open for discussion. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Doris. That was wonderful. Um, and I think, you know, your last point there too is a good one. Um, and I would sort of, you know, compliment that by saying, you know, a great product that fits your niche and your location that you can compete globally and that is bringing added value, you know, back to the, back to the community. That's great. Um, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Priscilla Nelson from the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, while she's going ahead and getting her screen share set up. Um, and I think actually, Doris, you might have to click stop um, so that she's able to do that. Um, while she's changing the slides, I am gonna say we had a question in the chat from Andre about some of the education resources we shared, asking if they were for minors. Um, I'm just gonna say that the SDG Academy, all of our massive open online courses are um, geared towards a general audience. So it could be minors, it could be executives, it could be students of mining. Um, it, it really is very broad at all levels. So I would encourage you to check them out. And I will add as well that Priscilla put a link in the chat to a number of resources that the Colorado School of Mines offers freely available online. Um, I have a feeling those are probably maybe a little bit more narrowly tailored to minors as an audience. So I would strongly encourage everybody to um, check that out as well. And your slides look great. So Dr. Nelson, over to you. Thank oh, you very much. Maybe, I'm oh, gonna start go. my video and uh, that's great. So I was given this title and um, I, as is typical for me, I went off in a different direction. So I hope that you can tolerate this. My name is Priscilla Nelson. By training, I'm actually a geologist and a civil engineer. I came to Colorado School of Mines about eight years ago as the department head. And when I stepped down from that position, we were entering the tailings crisis that was really driven by some of the recent failures of our colleagues down um, of the mining that was being done down in uh, Brazil. 
in, in Australia and in Canada. And so I changed my focus to really working with um, the tailing center. We established a tailing center as a partnership with the University of Arizona and Colorado State. So if anyone wants any more information about that, please let me know. But talking about ESG and SDGs, um, the SDGs are really a broad set of goals targeting 2030 as the year for this to happen. Um, they do provide a framework for sustainable development thinking. Um, I must indicate that um, as Doris indicated, it's a question of scale. Over what scale are you going to try to integrate um, your address of these goals? Um, but the SDGs are generally more thematic and, uh, and corp not, not so much corporate centric, but they do help align between the two SDGs and ESGs. But you think about the ESGs and, and it really is dealing with responsible investment. ESG is all about risk. The ESG is a framework for how investors can assess risk, how they should assess risk, how they should report risk. Some ESGs are directly associated with the SDG goals, but ESG transparency and disclosure mandates are definitely aligned with the SDG, um, aligned but not mapped directly. Uh, in the corporate offices, the definition of ESG is often guided by ICMM, um, measuring and disclosing how non-financial risks and opportunities that are related to the planet and its people are managed. So the basic sense of planet and people is increasingly important. Strongly risk-focused in the uh, boardroom. Uh, things have to be specific and measurable. Be careful what you use as your metric because it will drive the behavior that's going to result. Um, they're assessed by multiple ratings organizations and everyone's making up new ones seemingly every day. And it really targets investors, banks, insurers, governments, and customers. Um, but ESG investing is really thinking about environmental. How does a company act as an environmental steward in whatever region it's defined, whatever scale? Um, social aspects, how does the company treat the employees, its customers, and the communities in which it operates? And then governance, how does a company govern itself, which is currently receiving quite a bit of scrutiny. But I caution to not ignore the second G, and I call it ESGG, because we have two Gs, the governance of the corporation, but also the governance of the government. And um, this varies widely across the, the globe. And I, I think we know how to do the governance of the government better than we are doing it right now. Um, a lot of economics people, policy people have paid attention. And I think this has got to be wrapped into this whole thing. So it's not just planet, people, and profit. And we'll come back and talk about the profit in, in a little bit. ESG and business. Um, for the last several years, big things have been happening. I note that uh, the Norges Bank dropped 12 companies from its uh, sovereign wealth fund um, due to environmental and human rights concerns. And another four were placed under scrutiny because of um, uh, production of coal-based energy. Um, and Wall Street ESG loans are concerned about uh, establishing these goals and then having the goals being missed and writing articles about it. But it's come to be clear that ESG itself and the way you report it is a source of risk for the mining industry. And the management of ESG within the corporation um, is a lot of, uh, in many cases, um, corporate commitments are stated, but the commitments are rarely translated into systematic measures. So various organizations have tried to map the ESGs over to the SDGs. This is one attempt that was done by Sustainometric. And, and you can see that a lot of this has to do with uh, social aspects and environment, and uh, fewer of the uh, goals are really linked into the governance aspects in this mapping. Um, this mapping here by Berenberg, um, really divides the, the SDGs into environmental, social, and governance hats. Um, and it helps to understand that, uh, how people should be thinking about this mapping. Um, but I don't want to go too much into the depth of, of how you map and, and what's wrong or what's right. 
with different kinds of mappings. Instead, I'd like to, to go to a sort of maybe tangential, but I think very important way of thinking. Um, in uh, 2017, uh, Kate Rayworth um, from Oxford uh, published a book called Donut Economics that was based on an Oxfam paper that she wrote back in uh, 2012. And quite a number of uh, my slides in the future are from um, Kate's work and from other people who have analyzed the work. Um, she talks about uh, the donut economics as a place where um, we should be operating that is in a safe zone between social equity and environmental planetary systems boundaries that we must acknowledge in all decisions. This provides a, a framework for the vision for how um, individual companies need to understand they relate to other companies and to other people and to effectively um, operating in the globe. So the donut is um, establishes a space which is uh, within the planetary boundaries of what the planet can provide. And it also uh, establishes an interface which is called human needs, um, defining the basic human needs that are needed on the planet. And therefore we have this inner circle of the donut, which we do not want to go into because that constitutes harming people, not supplying the basic needs that um, everyone in the world increasingly has reasonable expectations to receive. And the outer boundary then is the boundary of harming the planet, which also must not be done um, if we're going to have a sustainable uh, planet. So we have effectively, and maybe uh, no doubt somewhat simplistically, we have the societal foundations um, of the human needs, which are really dominantly ex um, exhibited by the SDGs. And then we have the planetary limits of the whole economic enterprise that really is defined primarily by the ESGs. Um, so this creates a donut. Um, Kate has worked with uh, the donut concept and established this kind of a plot where you can see on the outer boundary, the planetary boundary, sometimes called the ecological ceiling. You're talking about major, um, major things that we don't thoroughly understand but we understand enough about them to know that um, they are important and we need to respect them. So the outer boundary includes um, the condition of the ocean and the waters on the earth, um, food production and fertilizer and phosphorus and nitrogen loading, um, biodiversity, air pollution, ozone, air layer depletion. Some of these we know more about so we can establish limits and those are marked red. Some of them we really don't really know exactly how close we are to any kind of a threshold that must be respected if we're going to have a sustainable planet. And similarly, the uh, societal foundation, the human needs are defined on the inside. The basic sense is that any company needs to operate in the donut um, and respect and make clear that they are providing and contributing to um, the basic human needs that are needed on the planet for our society while respecting the planetary boundary, which is uh, really uh, focused on the sustainability long-term of the planet. So we live and work in the dough. And if you can look at this, this plot, there's some recent um, news items that really bear on each of those um, characteristics. So we see that we have a crisis developing on each of those ecological or planetary boundary systems. And we're finding more and more about these systems um, and our understanding will allow us to figure out how to deal with that planetary boundary. Um, in the center, we've got the richest 1% owning half of the world's wealth. There's a problem with wealth distribution and provision for those fundamental rights of uh, humans on the planet as we um, want the planet to be. Uh, this is an issue of scale as well, though. This is a uh, cartoon about the donut where you can see all of the parts of the donut 
um, uh, on the inner circle shown. Um, and in the center, we have a pit where there's too many people that are stuck in the hole and they're falling short on life's essentials. So any decision made ought to be thinking about how do we keep people out of the hole or if they're in the hole, pull them back out, not let them fall in. Meanwhile, on this scale, which is a city as it's uh, drawn, and it seems to be along the uh, English Channel coast, because you can see the chalk cliffs um, by the water, um, you're thinking about the questions of what, uh, what, how does that city interact with its planet, its zone that's in the vicinity of it. Now, people have taken these ideas and, and tried to map, for example, the SDGs into the donut. And you can see that many of the SDGs in this representation are really associated with that social foundation, establishing the fundamental human rights um, to build their own sustainable lives um, on the planet. And on the outside, you can see that there are fewer of the SDGs that bear upon that planetary boundary, the environmental ceiling. Um, this concept has actually been taken over as well into the energy world. And rather than calling it a donut, they have decided to call it the, ener the energy bagel. But it's the same kind of idea of we have this basic um, uh, expectation for access to energy um, to build all kinds of enterprises at the same time as we are not interfering with um, the planetary function so that we have a sustainable society. So success in life, in life and work, um, whether you're talking about mining or any industry, must be inside the dome and dough, and it must respect two mandates. One is regenerative design and decisions. And this actually bears upon engaging the circular economy. Very often mining companies want to mine. That is what they want to do. Um, the recent competition that was uh, run by BHP, primarily in Chile, um, was really focused on taking the mine waste tailings and doing something useful with them. Um, but the mining industry in, in that context had no intention to actually take care of the tailings um, in that aspect themselves. So I think we have a mining industry that is not engaging the circular economy appropriately. And this is a major driver for the future of the mining industry, I think, is to think more in terms of circular economy, in terms of regenerative operations. And we also have to deal with distributed design, which actually provides equitable access and sharing to the people. So the regenerative design is really focusing on operation in the dome, in the dough, without engaging the planetary boundary. Distributed design is really focusing on that inner part of the donut and keeping people out of the hole. So just to carry that a little forward, regenerative design in many cases these days is take, make, use, lose. And that's the end of it. Um, and very often a philosophy that is adopted by many mining industry people. Um, we need to go to a regenerative design where we take, make, use, consume, regenerate, restore, and reuse. That might be mapped out something like this, um, where we increasingly run on renewables, where the waste from one process equals food for another, where we have a modular design that really is appropriate and can be selected in the context of the culture where the operations are going, and where, um, in fact, what you're asking the companies to do is to consider um, what they're doing as a service to the community in the area, rather than as simply making profit. Um, distributed by design deals with sharing value equi equitably that is produced by the social and economic engines that we have on this planet. And the fact that that 1% of the population owns half of the world's wealth indicates as a reflection of how undistributed um, the global current economy is. Um, we think about enterprise ownership. We think about um, ethical supply chains, community empowerment, open source design. These are all um, uh, processes 
all decisions that can be made that really lead towards increasing distribution. So we can think rather simplistically about in the, in the 20th century, we were centralizing enterprise and capturing as much value as possible for those who own that enterprise. Um, and looking towards the 21st century with increasingly distributive enterprise where we share value far more equitably with those who create and use it. Um, so the question becomes in this context, can business, that be mining in this case, do business in the donut? To stay in the donut and to use distributed uh, operations by design, intentional regeneration by design. And you can take this all the way from doing nothing to do what pays now, to do your fair share, to do mission zero, which means no impact on the planet and nobody falling in the holes, and effectively working towards doing the donut. It depends on the design of the business itself and business mining has to think differently about it in the future. 20th century extractive enterprise focused on how much financial value can we extract from this company and this operation? And we move towards a generative enterprise in the 21st century where we ask how many benefits can we generate as a mining company in the way in which we design our operations and the time framework over which we think about the impacts of our operations. Um, so, um, very often you hear about the focus on GDP growth and this whole donut suggests that G GDP growth is not the driver for life and work in the dough. That growth centric thinking is deeply ingrained in economics and it profoundly influences world economic views, um, creating an expectation of and a belief in the possibilities of endless GDP growth even in the richest of countries and certainly in the poorest. However, there is no evidence that unbridled growth can be made compatible with preserving the integrity of the planetary systems and the social foundation systems on which we all depend. So we have to think differently about this GDP growth and that churning engine of economy is not unbridled growth. It becomes a case of managed and sustainable operations that respect the planetary boundary and that provide um, all of the people uh, with security um, against falling in the hole. Um, so the last slide that I have, my computer is acting strangely. Um, I've got that says this, in practice, excelling at life and work in the dough means focusing on building solutions in the middle ground of the donut, where the environmental planetary preservation is respected, protected, and where we tackle inequalities without causing more harm to our planet and where citizens themselves can play a key role in driving process. And this is a model. And as George Box said, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I suggest that the donut economics model is useful and is uh, a way of maintaining this overall vision of what we are trying to do um, to build a sustainable planet and a secure and respected um, society. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Uh, I will confess that I was quite familiar with the donut economics, but I had not seen the energy bagel before, um, which is definitely <laughs> something that I'm going to be adding to my future slides. Um, and I think is a very useful communications tool for, for everyone with what we're trying to achieve here. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in from our participants. I'm so grateful for those. If anybody else wants to add to the queue, um, the queue of questions, there's a Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom window and you can type them in. Um, I'm gonna start with these before I turn to some of my own and I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Doris and Renato to go ahead and maybe turn on your cameras again for this uh, discussion. And I'm going to see if Sonia can maybe put us back into gallery as opposed to spotlighting. Um, 
So the first question is for, I'm gonna tentatively say Renato because it's about the case of Brazil specifically. Vania is asking about illegal gold production and the Guerra Empereros and um, you know, what we think we could do about that as a challenge. Uh, asking, is there any initiative to address this issue? Um, is there anything we could do to address the illegal gold marketplace? Um, after you take that first, I'm going to possibly broad it, broaden it to um, both Doris and Priscilla. I don't know if you have thoughts as well, sort of on some of the things around um, value chains and certification schemes and, you know, in your experience, different things that we can do as well to, um, I would say more broadly sort of enforce best practices insofar as that is possible um, in some of these areas. But Renato, please, uh, we'll go you first um, and then Doris and then Priscilla, if you have anything to add. Well, Vanya is a close friend, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, well, uh, I, I have a, a response that maybe is not, uh, it maybe is more aggressive, but, um, I'm not sure if uh, uh, prospecting is, uh, is illegal in Brazil, gold prospecting, the Garimperos, because uh, the government, current government is favoring uh, the Garimperos, okay? So we have to review that. In fact, we need, we need uh, the society really to, to, to be stronger in establishing their values, okay? Uh, I don't think right now we cannot say that Garimperos are, are illegal because they have been supported. If nobody else has anything to add. Lauren, you asked me to say something. Can you repeat briefly the question because I missed the question. Yeah, so um, this question was specifically about um, different incentives you can use to reduce illegal gold mining um, in Brazil. And one of the questions that was raised was um, different incentives that you could impose on the value chain. Um, and I thought, you know, either you or Priscilla might want to come into this. You know, to me, there's a larger question about what else is possible. Um, there was a slide on the ESG conditionalities that are imposed on some loans, um, particularly from wealthy countries, you know, coming into maybe some countries with less enforcement being ineffective. You know, is there a way to make that effective? Have you seen certification schemes that are effective? You know, is there any sort of this broad question of, does anybody have a good case study of, of a way that we've you know, been able to kind of um, impose better regulations or restrictions through the value chain? I guess my only comment is we are buried with the standards. You can see by the tailings, for example, there are so many. We are buried with uh, things, but I think we have to go beyond compliance into creating value. And we have to start by seeing value differently. And from the very beginning, from mining, you know, understand the geology of the ore body and start with a value concept from beginning to end. So I guess my opinion is to go way beyond it's being compliance force requirements. We are way, it's too late for that. <laughs> and people don't follow any policies anyhow. So anyhow, my, my opinion is we have restructured the whole value in, in mining. And instead of uh, you know, handling so much waste and creating so much waste, value from everything you do every step of the way, understanding the ore body to begin with. So everybody should be studying geoscience to begin with. <laughs> Thank you. So let me, let me add to that. I, I... I particularly appreciate uh, Doris's comment that is something that I call geometallurgy, understanding the value in the mountain and all the way through the entire processing. Um, and there's some companies like LKAB that really, um, their focus is to try to get to the point where there is absolutely no waste, where 100% of the material that they remove from the mountain is actually used in a useful purpose. But the issue of small scale mining, whether it's illegal or not, um, is something that I think we have to address. 
many, many more people in the mining industry are associated with small scale mining than it, with big scale mining. There, it is a way of life. And yes, it does have environmental consequences, whether you're talking about mercury or cyanide or anything else, there are environmental consequences, but it is a way of life. And I think what we need to do is to figure out how to make that way of life viable and productive and, um, and uh, not compromising the planet and keeping people out of the hole. And in places where it's practiced, it keeps people out of the hole, which is why it continues. So from the donut perspective, we have to figure out how to make it so that it doesn't impact on the environmental boundaries and, um, and is viable. And I think we can do that rather than trying to uh, make policy or laws that restrict it and say it's illegal is to instead think about how to make it illegal, viable in a, um, a real way of life um, for many uh, people in many countries around the world. Thank you, Priscilla. Renato, it looks like you want to come in again as well on this question. Please go ahead. Yeah, just to, to complement, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the issue regarding payers is a, is a very complex issue and we cannot mix. And I, can, I think that the, either large scale mines or small scale mines, we, we, we really, the, the, these are two, two different situations. So, uh, the Garimpero thing needs a needs a, a very intense political discussion and social discussion. Uh, concerning mining, the conventional mining, the legal mining, uh, either small or large one. Uh, and from the presentations of uh, Doris and, and Priscilla, it's very clear that we need a major transformation culture at the mining industry and the, at the territory, at stakeholders, communities, and government. And, and I'm not sure, I understand the point of the champions, the, 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 the function and of, yeah, of the, the champions, but certainly we need to, to address changing culture. And I don't think it's, it's being done right now. I think that we are not respecting the importance of the, of the issues of culture, difference in culture, in the lane of this, of this move that have been presented here, either by Doris or by, by Priscilla. Thank you. Um, we're gonna turn to a next question from uh, Garrett. It's a, for Doris about DSP. He's asking, what is the motivation for the mining company to participate in the diversified future economy? Is it because they want to be good corporate citizens? Is it part of social license to operate during the approval process? Are there economic benefits to the mine? Um, you know, could you come in and, and share any insight on this? Thank you. There's two things. It costs less. Uh, the current situation is the mining company is trapped being the only provider of income, the driver of the economy, the engine of the economy. And, and we are hated no matter what we do. We do good things. So if we continue doing the same thing, we'll be hated even more. And it costs a lot of money to get by. You know, and, and that's your core, the mining core competency is not trying to take the role of the government, trying to take the role of every single thing that goes wrong in the region. So they know how to do mining and they, they can do that very well. And they really need to perhaps release those duties to innovate more in mining and focus on value and restructure the way they do mining. And, the impact of mining in the regions uh, is wider than the boundaries of the mine. So it's like a guest, you know, you go and visit, a, 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 you're a guest at the house. It's temporary. You don't break the room and leave the bed all, and then, you know, leave, leave the place worse than you found before you arrived. So 
it's how, how can I say you are a host, you are a guest, temporary guest. What you leave behind, and um, but what I'm saying with ESP, the mining doesn't build the diversification of the economy. They become the catalyst. So right now they have all the responsibility on their shoulders. They are the bad father that gives everything. And the, the child never learns anything at the end you leave. And what happens? It was the bad father. It gave everything and did everything. So if the mining company is going to diversify, it has to stay forever. And that's not sustainable. And that's not their competence unless they want to invest in other businesses. So I'm talking about regional prosperity and the mining is, becomes the catalyst, becomes perhaps the first champion to bring everyone to the table for all to work together for the common good. So it becomes transparency. The target isn't any longer the mining, but the future economy for the region. And when I say economy, please, I'm not talking about the industrial revolution or anything like that, more nature-based solutions. So what's the idea for each region? What IP can be developed? And what long lasting enterprises can be developed? So they become just the catalyst, like the enabler, the trampoline to begin with. And, and then other investors come to, to town. <clears throat> so you build resilience in the region, you de-risk your investment. And by doing that, you are not, you, 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 how can I say, it costs you a lot less because you don't have to invest trying to get by and never be able to sleep quietly because you don't know which way is going to, you know, what problems you're going to encounter because it's not sustainable to keep doing everything to get by. So let me follow up on that because the basic sense I always see these days is that mining views um, this kind of behavior as a way to decrease risk. They see there being a large risk associated with the, the social uh, community aspects and the social license. So they're fighting risk. The, the situation as I see it though is you want that to be them to see it as a win-win. And if the only thing they're doing is staying the same, but just paying attention to risk, that means that they start hiring sociologists and anthropologists to go out and take care of the communities and to make everybody happy. But philosophically, mining is not engaging the circular economy. And if all it does is convene, I, th I think mining itself has to change much in the way that the petroleum industry has um, has become much more into the circular economy where they've paid attention to the downstream operations. They all have subsidiaries that are doing chemical um, process making. They're not just producing petroleum, they're actually inventing things to do with the petroleum. And in mining, it's, it's much more, we want to stay the way we are. And in order to operate the way we operate, we have to keep the people happy. And that's not really a win-win. And so I think we need a fundamental change in the mining industry that will lead it to engage um, the circular economy. And maybe instead of just mapping material flow, we ought to be mapping responsibility flow through the earth resource cycle and really try to figure out what are the responsibilities and make it very clear to, to companies that there are responsibilities they are not taking on right now. And they could, and they could actually take them on and perhaps um, develop new enterprises, um, become more partners than godfathers. Yeah, become a force of good rather than being hated and cost less and focus on mining and innovate and create value. Next question. <laughs> um, great. Uh, I'm going to ask another question for Doris. Um, this one is very concrete about um, 
generating a more diversified economy when the mine is operating. And um, the mining companies tend to offer more attractive wages than other sectors that are coming in. And there might be less interest and incentive um, to grow these other sectors while the mine is operating and it's a good job. Um, so um, specifically asking, you know, how do you kind of overcome this sort of wage disincentive on diversification? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, the diversification I'm talking about is uh, for mining regions where mining is perhaps uh, the only provider of income. As you develop these uh, long lasting enterprises that are mostly nature based, I have to uh, emphasize that. So they are not, you know, more of the doing the same thing or so. I believe to begin with, you know, once we do this, if we, if we, if we go with this DSP uh, method, you know, we do really a lot of work to figure out what's ideal for region based on all these elements that I already discussed. So we come up with really things we never thought of. And, and we go into developing IP for the region. So, so first, uh, the people get internalized, get passionate and want to really do because it makes sense. But also we bring the government, of course, because it's all players to create the environment for this for to work. So initially to, to provide incentives for it to work so that it can have its own life and be profitable in, in the future. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a good point. It's not easy to solve. Yes, because mining, you know, the difference of pay is enormous. And why would you do something else? But in most of the cases, we start with energy, low cost of energy, affordable energy, and then you bring another player for energy. So so I believe you know uh, it could be competitive salaries but a little bit of help to begin with, but um, I don't see it as a, it's, it's an issue right now, the way that we see the situation, but uh, with this approach, I believe it may be an issue to begin with, but it can be competitive very soon. Thank you. Uh, Renato, you wanna come in on this? And then my next question is gonna be to you. So I'll tell you to keep your microphone open. <laughs> yeah, just to, to compliment, uh, I understand the question. We are coming back again to the, the difference in culture of mining, okay? So the, 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 the culture of mining to dominate the problems. So let's dominate the society. Yeah? Uh, when we, we talk about looking for diversification of the economy, we have to understand that society is, is, is diverse by nature, okay? So it's just a question of respecting the choice, uh, the choices of the of the local society. It's there, okay. The, the diversification is there, and people is is ready to let's say to receive the, the the stimulation and the effort and the and the subsidies and financial support for diversification. It's 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 natural. It's, it, it's, it, I think that we have to respect that. Um, I was also going to follow up. Alan is asking you, Renato, um, have you achieved UNESCO geopark status given the issue of mining? Could you maybe, for people who don't know, maybe give a little bit about you know what the what the UNESCO geopark accreditation is, and you know a little bit on the process. Well, the the the, the our geopark okay is uh, is a. Uh, uh, we applied for that 10 years ago, okay, for the geopark of the, the region, mining region. We'll give him one more second to see if the connection gets restored. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I just wanted to say one one thing about mm -hmm. um, uh, give some kudos to Vale um, down in Brazil that has had uh, um, a number of years of 
of high concerns related to tailings, but their attitude has been quite quite strong in terms of trying to find those downstream uses for their tailings and get to the point where it's it's really engaging the circular economy. So I just wanted to give some kudos to that activity down in, in Brazil and Valley. Um, Renato, I'll come back to you in just one moment, but I want to tack on to Priscilla as well. Um, Vania, that was another example that she submitted through the Q&A was a Vale example where they're taking tailings and waste rock and turning it into agricultural soil. Um, you know, I had shared this case study of water use. I don't know, Priscilla, as well, do you maybe have one or two thoughts on some of the more creative innovations that people are yeah. coming up with to yeah. handle tailings? Well, I think Vale is trying to, um, they've already done some um, some separations and they, they are creating a market for sand. People on the call might not know the world is running out of sand, which is a major component of concrete, which is a highly non-recycled material. But I think some of the very interesting things that we're finding out, um, and, and the mention was also of um, working on nickel mining up in Canada. Um, what they're finding is that uh, the ultramafic rock characteristic of, of nickel ore um, weathers very fastly. And as it weathers, it sequesters CO2. So we're actually working on a project right now to see if we can microbially enhance um, more common kinds of rock to weather them faster. And uh, can you imagine, um, the mining industry would become the greenest of all if it sequestered all of the CO2 that was being produced. It's not, it's not something that is unimaginable. And I think we're, we're going to, over the next 10 years, find out what can and cannot be done there. So there are mining companies that are thinking about engaging the circular economy and the planetary boundaries in addition to the hole in the middle of the donut. That would be a very exciting solution um, and a really great use of uh, waste material um, mm -hmm. to really meet a real need. Renata, we'll come back to you if you have anything you want to add on this point, or again, back to the, the question of the sort of UNESCO geopark status. Please go ahead. I know it's, uh, I'm here just to, I'm, I apologize for losing the signal, but I'm ready to respond referring the, the geopark. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, okay. Well, the, the, the geopark, uh, Nestle geopark that uh, was being implemented in the region of iron ore in the mineralized state, we got the, the candidacy approval by UNESCO in 2011. Uh, we have been responding to many, to many demands of, trans of change in the, in the governance of the, of the geopark and supply of information and uh, to risk uh, activities and so on. But it's clear that uh, there are difficulties to run a geopark within inside a major mining area. Okay, it, it's very difficult. So it's our proposal now to review the the, the how we we establish a new a new area of geopark that don't conflict with mining. Absolutely no conf conflict with mining and then resume all the developments uh, in a way to establish a more uh, close relationship with mining operations and geopark operations. As we reach this, 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 this relationship, more close relationship, we can resume again the development. Um, well, we are coming towards the end of our time, but I think I will throw out one more question. Uh, Felipe is asking about the energy transition. Specifically, do we have enough minerals to supply all of the demand that's going to be needed for batteries, electric vehicles, etc.? Um, what would this mean for commodities prices? Um, if commodities become more expensive, would the transition be slowed? Um, you know, anybody who has thoughts on this, and Priscilla, I saw you nod, so maybe we'll go to you first this time, then Doris, then Renato. Well, you know, I think the, the energy transition and the critical minerals aspects um, merge. And, um, and it's only really being thought of clearly on a geopolitical framework. And 
it, and it cannot be. Um, if we're going to get enough of the minerals that are needed, we have to think about how to how to do startup, how to do um, secondary processing, how to do primary processing, but how to recycle tailings, how to remine tailings. And this is an opportunity to figure out how to do it right, where we create an environment that's um, that's not abusive, that is sustainable. And so the question to Doris would become taking the DSP idea. How do you do that in the context? Or can we lay out a plan for how startups or people who want to go and mine tailings, people who want to um, do that critical mineral finding that is necessary for the energy transition, can we lay out a plan for how those startups can start to do that? Because they don't know. We have a research project right now from the National Science Foundation in the United States that is actually geared towards trying to figure out what the framework should be for a company that wants to develop um, these critical mineral supplies that are needed for the energy transition. And I think a lot of the startups would benefit from having that kind of a framework laid out so that they understand how to do it right the first time. Yes, yes, of course, uh, DSP, uh, DSP is adapted to the needs of the region and the mining companies. So, for example, also there is a bit, you know, a skill shortage is one of the big issues we're dealing in the industry right now. And then we are, we have a big effort for years to work what skills uh, we need to develop for the future, but we don't know what skills will we need in the future. So DSP also comes nicely there to figure out what are the pillars of a future economy for this region, and therefore what will be the skills needed in the future. So yes, it's adapted to it, and we can talk uh, uh, later about it. But I just wanted to go back to this uh, energy transition. So uh, my opinion is because I'm a metallurgist researcher, and then, so we are we are trying to you know, all this noise and, and predictions is very hard to do it right now. We don't know if it's going to happen. So we are counting on EV. So there's two things first. The way we are growing is not sustainable. So we are counting a number of vehicles for, for, for person. What if we suddenly we change to more mass transport? So that's one idea. The other one is there is, Every, every um, metal can be replaced. And research labs are going full blown to replace anything that is uh, a problem or is too expensive. It may not take overnight. So initially, yes, uh, the, the critical materials will be needed, but we don't know which way is going to go. So we cannot count that's going to be we have to count that it may happen, it might not happen. It may go this way or it may go that way. So if I invest in one mineral and it happens that's been replaced because you know new innovation has uh, just come out and changed the landscape. So we don't know what's going to happen. So we cannot count on that just 100% and invest and so on. I believe we have to be uh, careful. You know, It could happen or it could not happen and therefore invest for all the right reasons. I wouldn't worry about that, but rather do it right. I think the biggest thing for mining, I believe, is you know, we have so many technologies available now. We are automating stuff, but we are automating obsolete ways of doing things. I believe we have to start rethinking mining on on the value, you know, we have an ore body, we have to extract the value of it. Why do we handle so much waste? So rethink, change entirely how we do mining. We've been doing for years the same way. This is our chance to rethink a new way of doing, then automate. So streamline entirely, zero waste and no impact to the environment. How can we do mining, continue doing mining and, and support? Because we are, you know, the, the transition, energetic transition is a game changer for mining. 
we have become strategic, we can become a force of good if you do it right. Thank you, Doris. Renato, any final thoughts from you? And then I'll, I'll wrap us up. Sure. Just uh, I, I eventually will consolidate uh, Doris and, and Priscilla. Uh, first of all, uh, we are in a period of revolution in science and technology. And certainly we don't know very clear the future, much more transformation. We certainly will reach a new equilibrium in terms of demand and availability of, of minerals. We, we need to look at substitution. There is a lot of room for substitution in, in, with energy minerals. Recycling certainly has to be uh, more profound. I have been a, a, a meeting in Stanford and, and it's very clear, for example, take of the United States and Canada, how much exploration uh, effort is doing for new sources in US, Canada, and other countries. And again, we are looking for a new sustainable world. So we may reach a new, a new scenario of demand and application and demand of energy and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I apologize to all the participants whose questions we couldn't get to. Um, we appreciate that you sent them and we were sorry. We did our best, but we did not have enough time. Thank you so much to our illustrious panel. Everybody made wonderful presentations. I really enjoyed listening to the discussion and your points. Um, for me, I'm taking home a lot of interesting messages. We talked a lot about integration and breaking down silos between different frameworks, different sectors. Um, we talked about how we can create a pipeline for, you know, closing some of the, the gaps in jobs and making sure we have enough people for mining in the future. We talked about governance at the country and the company level. We talked about the idea of an uh, expansion of a generative economy as opposed to sort of an unsustainable extract, extractive one. And I, I'm really excited about, you know, having all these ideas in my head for the rest of the day, it will give me energy. Thank you to our wonderful participants as well. This will be posted to the SDSN YouTube account and uh, we'll also send a link out to everyone who joined. And if anybody wants to get directly in touch with any of our panelists, um, you can also reply to that email and we'll do our best. Thank you so much to everyone who was up late with us, up early with us. I wish everybody a great rest of their day and evening, and we'll see you for our next webinar.